Hello, this is Pick, and welcome back to my guide for FTP Sky's Expert Mode. How many times do I almost say developer commentary by mistake? A lot. Today, I'll be working with the Thermomatic Processing Plant to automate biodiesel. Yeah, while well, I automated biodiesel before, this setup's going to be much more efficient, and faster probably. It's also going to make up for the fact that we removed the diesel generator mod in 1.3.3. Yeah, we're already at 1.3, I know. The changes are less drastic this time compared to 1.2s, so I'm only really going to bring up things that are relevant. Anyway, if you want to heat up the thermonomatic processing plant so that it goes to the temperature range of 30 to 60 degrees C, by far the easiest way is to put it at a low Y level, around 25. I'm not going to be doing this because there's another relatively simple way of accomplishing this without going all the way to the bottom of the world. Do note that if you want that 303k to 333k temperature, you're going to need to uninsulate the machine so that it can ambiently receive it from the environment. With the advent of easy diamonds, it's time to make some mega torches. This will be a really good way to keep hostile mobs out of my base. It's also worth noting that soul cages and dreadful dirt ignore this mega torch, so don't worry about them interfering with your mob farms as long as they're not based off of default spawn mechanics. Given the increased demand for compressed iron, I think it's about time we use that automated iron production to compress blocks of iron at a time. This means we're opening and closing the pressure chamber less, which allows us to make more use out of the pressure inside. Less is going to be lost due to that opening and closing. It's time to move and upgrade the pressure chamber. As a reminder, the more internal volume you have in your pressure system, the longer it's going to take for the pressure to change. This hurts you when waiting for the pressure to increase, but it also helps because it won't decrease as much. Because I'm going to need compressed air to craft better biodiesel to increase my stress units, I'm going to be shutting down parts of my facility to make sure I can dump all of the stress units into the rotational compressor. As you might guess or have experienced firsthand, if you let the pressure get too high, the thing's going to burst. You kind of don't want that, right? So, in order to do that, you want the compressors to turn off in the event the pressure gets too high. You could accomplish this with safety upgrades on literally everything, but why worry about those when you can stop the pressure from getting too high? First, to maximize the efficiency of my compressors, I'm going to be using a rotational speed controller. This inputs power from the lower axis and exports to the upper axis, which is the one connected to the cogwheel. By setting it to the maximum speed of 256 RPM, I can set the compressor to make air at the maximum rate. The simplest way to monitor pressure is to use a pressure gauge tube module. This is going to determine when the system is at a particular threshold of air pressure. It will emit a redstone signal of 1 and increase it by every time an extra half bar of pressure is put in. So from 0 to half a bar it exports 0, from half a bar to 1 it exports 1, all the way up to 9, well 10 I suppose if you go up to 5 bars, but for my purposes I'm just going to be setting it at 9. You can then use this in redstone in conjunction with the comparator and an analog lever set to a threshold of 9, and that will make sure that you never allow more pressure to go through the system than 4.5 bars of pressure. This is measured at the destination, so it's going to be a little higher towards the compressors, so if you want to do it like this, don't make the pressure gauge too far away from the compressors. The way I have it is going to balance at around 4.75 bar, which is both safe and still high enough. It gets turned off by the clutch, which disables the rotational power and thus stops more air from being generated. There are numerous useful upgrades within Pneumaticraft. The safety module will stop your machines from exploding because it'll allow discharge of air before it reaches the critical point. Speed upgrades allow machines to go faster depending on which machine it is, not all accept it. Most importantly for me though is going to be the dispensing upgrade. It's going to allow auto export of fluids between machines. This means you don't have to use pipes so things can be more compact. You'll notice I went ahead and prepared a bunch of machines already. This is for the setup I'm about to make. The general process for automating ethanol using Pneumaticraft requires two thermonomatic processing plants. However, I'm going to be using four because then I can double my production rate. I'm also going to leave room for two extra sets in case I need to make more. I'm not going to be doing this optimally. You could use Mendostein, which is grown in the Garden Cloche, and you can get that from a Shady Wizard if you want double the ethanol output, but because I still have sugar from the Witch Farm, I'm just going to use that for the time being. 
It's basically replacing those basins which aren't around anymore. Note that you will need to use mixers, I will make a video covering that soon. But anyway, you want all of your machines in thermal contact, this means they're all touching, and then they can share their heat evenly. But in order to get that, uh, let's see, 30 divided by 5 is 6, times 9 is 54, plus 32 is 86 F to 60 divided by 5 is 12, times 9 is 108, plus 32 is 140 F temperature range. I'll be using a vortex tube. You're going to need a regulator tube module, and then stick that on the edge of the pipe that the vortex tube is going to be on. Then make sure that you have the vortex tube with the hot end, that's the red end obviously, facing the machines. Put an analog lever next to it, and make sure that that regulator is receiving a redstone signal of 14. This means that only 0.3 bars are going to go into the vortex tube. If you don't regulate it, it's going to both A, be way too hot, and hit like the... I don't know, some insane temperature range, I was gonna make a joke in ranking, but anyway, it'll eat up all the pressure on your network as well, so it's not gonna be good for your machines if they are not at high enough pressure and you're wasting all that compressed air. Also be sure to uninsulate your machines, I wouldn't have any unnecessary blocks touching them, that way you can make sure that this temperature range stays in that constant area that you need it to be. To set those ejector upgrades, just make sure to click on the bottom of a block. You just right click the upgrade on the face that you want it to be. In this case for me, it's the bottom and that'll have it auto export out the bottom. Mushrooms are going in the top via material generator and sugars being imported from the witch farm. And that should be ethanol taken care of. Real quick, I'm gonna demonstrate what happens when the pressure passes the threshold. It's like I said, it'll automatically turn off past 4.5 bars. Normally, if you use redstone and distance to turn it off, you might get some stuttering. That might cause problems for your computer. It gets to be taxing on the game to constantly update it. But for whatever reason, my setup with the comparator seems to work every time and not like flicker insane. I don't know exactly why this happens, but that's what I'm doing, so copy my setup if you have flickering problems. Like before, I happen to use seeds to make my vegetable oil. They're just made in the thermopneumatic processing plant now, which means that they make double the vegetable oil they made before, but they require pressure instead of rotational power. I think it's faster and it's more efficient though, so don't worry about it. Speaking of the compressors though, I would just buffer your system with rotational power to make sure you always have enough to run your compressors. Don't be afraid to run less if you don't have the SU to support it. We're working on SU right now though, so we should have plenty. To operate the pressure chamber, instead of using those pedestals, you should probably just use hoppers instead. The trigger for the pressure chamber to input or export items is the stopping of transfer, so because the pedestals transport and then stop, it triggers them to start early. With the hoppers, they constantly import or export. Also, to make use of the output, I will be using an omnidirectional hopper. Shift right click it onto whatever inventory you're using it on, and then just make sure you use a wrench to rotate the input to wherever it's supposed to be. To combine the two at a higher rate and get a glycerol byproduct out of it, you're going to want to make your biodiesel in the fluid mixers. I am again using two fluid mixers, and the fluid mixers have a special mechanic where the higher the pressure you give them, the faster they'll craft. So this is a benefit to keeping them close to your compressors. Note that pressure does drop over the course of the tube, so if you make it too far away, it's going to be running at a much lower pressure than you might want it to. I've also entirely contained this setup within one chunk. I go through a couple different ideas on how I want to organize it, and ultimately I wound up just putting the fluid mixers one apart from each other. Now then, it's time to make some useful enchantments to help bolster our production of biodiesel. As we know, I've been using a Looting 3 sword on that witch farm. However, we can do much better. First of all, the Soul Steel sword I was using cannot be infused with water, so I've switched to Netherite. I got Netherite ingots as loot from a Nether village. A stronger sword will be capable of taking mobs down faster, which means it'll be using less energy on the pedestal if I can knock it down from a 4 hit KO range to a 2 hit KO range. In addition, we can get that looting 3 as our base, but by bartering with piglins, you can get tomes for looting, which means you can increase that level for every tome you have, up to the maximum it tells you. 
This is a good way to not have to deal with Apotheosis early on if you just want it for looting for your pedestals. This means I now have a Netherite Sword with High Sharpness, Bane of Illagers, which is just lucky really, but that's okay, and looting 7. This means that I'll be getting much more sugar and it'll be able to keep up with the biodiesel production. Who wants a real quick wither fight? I can finally get one now that I've been bartering with piglins for a while and I need a nether star. Not much to say about it. Mediocre gear is good enough and I can fly. I did it inside the island, though that is a little risky because the wither could still break all the blocks. So, what did I want that nether star for? Well, I'll be upgrading the harvester pedestal to have it gently harvest. This means that it won't have to worry about the planter and I can just get rid of the planter entirely. Upgrading pedestals is a little weird to do, but not too difficult, most of the time. I've heard it can be a little buggy sometimes, depending on the upgrade you're looking to insert. To set this up, you need a Work Location Pedestals card. Specifically pedestals, not area, or not specific block locations. Right-click them in an order that you'll remember. I'd recommend just doing it in a 3x3 and knowing which orientation to go from, as the slot numbers do matter. Then simply input that as a work card onto the pedestal with the modification upgrade in it. Put the items in in the same order you see them in JEI, and then put a pedestal in the chest underneath the pedestal with the modification upgrade. This'll imbue that upgrade with whatever upgrade you're giving it. Uh, or maybe enhancement? I don't know what different word I'd use, but you get the point. In this case, I want to use another star and shears to give that gentle harvesting. One other thing of note is that, like everything else, these pedestals are affected by enchantments. If you're a boomer like me, you'd forget until now that you can use fortune to increase certain yields using a hoe. This applies to the harvester, of course. Thanks to Quark, you can also automatically get fortune 2 on anything you have equipped. This means that you can give a free fortune 2 hoe to your harvester, and since durability isn't a problem, it'll last forever. After a mishap we won't discuss, I've decided I should set up another flight ritual. This is going to be a little closer to the new area I'm building with. I'm not getting around to building this facility just yet, but I've at least drafted out the basics. I'd like all of my regular machines to be in one place so that I'm not making some abomination of a setup that's really messy. But how will I get Source all the way over there from my farm? Well, I can use Source Relays. Source Relays function a little like Mana Spreaders. They send Source from one relay to the next and can do some different things with different types of relays. For example, the Splitter can, well, split. It's self-explanatory. In this case, I'm going to be using Source Relays to send Source to a Source Jar that will power a new flight ritual that I can use for building. To link relays, you simply right-click on one of them and then right-click on the one it's going to. They're kind of like pedestals if you think about it. I think it's about time to get some latex processing going. Latex rubber sheets, uh, formerly known as plastic sheets, are used in a wide variety of recipes at this stage of the game. They're also a ticket to further automation with industrial foregoing. It just takes some latex and some water, latex coming from those fluid extractors, and then water can just come from an aqueous accumulator. I never actually mentioned it directly, but you can waterlog leaves and put them next to an aqueous accumulator, and you can have water sources that don't flow all over the place. The next thing on the automation agenda is cakes. I'll be automating the Kekimuris. I think in this world I'm going to do a little bit of all the types of Batania mana generation, so you'll get to see a variety of everything. But since cakes were first, and I don't feel like setting up the RF power flower, I'll just be using cakes. To review the ingredients, I need wheat, which is wheat flour, and I have wheat growing already, and I'm not using it for anything, so that's taken care of. Eggs are being made in the compact machine. I haven't gotten to automate production of that yet completely because they're all being stored inside a drawer inside the machine, but I'll be making a tunnel later in the episode, don't worry. Sugar is being made from the witch farm, which is now using that lovely looting seven sword. And that basically just leaves milk and sweet berries for things I haven't automated yet, which thanks to industrial foregoing is going to be super easy. To farm the sweet berries though, I'll be using Immersive Engineering's Garden Cloches. By infusing some Terra Preta in the Elemental Infuser with Earth, you can make a better soil for it. Better soils allow for higher yields and faster crop growth. You can also boost it with fertilizer like bone meal. I think two cloches will be enough for farming the sweet berries I need for icing. Beyond that, I just have to assemble the whole thing and explain what I did. 
the setup I made is fairly compact. A millstone is milling the wheat into wheat flour. That wheat flour, combined with the eggs, milk, and sugar, get turned into cake batter. A lot of things are fed via pedestals because that's the most convenient way for me to do it. I will be hoppering in from the compact machine for the eggs when the time comes. A fluid transporter is whitelisted to only move cake batter from one basin to the next to make sure no milk gets through. The press then stamps it and makes a raw cake base. The basin auto outputs onto a depot. This depot is getting blown on by two fans with campfires. Having two fans allows the smoking to happen twice as quickly. At that point, a brass funnel is filtered to only have the cooked cake bases come out of the funnel and across the item drain onto the other depot, or it then gets splurted by the icing. To make the icing, I have the sweet berries coming in as well as the milk, and that's simply just getting mixed up together and going into the spout. And yeah, that's pretty much cake production. It's not as hard as it looks. Of course, you need to know your way around moving your kinetic power, but, well, you know, that's something that requires some practice. I ended up having to upgrade my power gen a bit by making a couple more engines, but that's okay, I needed the extra stress units anyway. This then gets exported by, you guessed it, pedestals, and it's going to be sent back over to the biodiesel production area. With that out of the way, it's time to get on more fluid crafting. First up is liquid ethylene. This is made with ethanol and sulfur dust in the thermonomatic processing plant. You'll need to make sure you have a high enough temperature to produce it. Also, if it wasn't obvious enough, sulfur dust comes from sulfur, which we got from sifting, and then that gets pulverized into sulfur dust. Put your thermal lagging on the thermonomatic processing plant to make sure it doesn't lose heat, attach the blaze burner, and heat it up. Then it's time to combine the liquid ethylene with the latex to get polyethylene. There are several types of plastic to make in this pack, hence why they're all called different things. I made a fluid encapsulator, and then we can use that with our polyethylene and our latex rubber sheets to get LDPE, that's low density polyethylene. Used in a number of recipes at this stage, but I mean that's kind of obvious, why do I even say that? The goal here is the liquid crystallizer, which is a mana using machine, hence why I went with cake automation. It doesn't get much simpler to be placing blocks automatically than with a block placer, so I've hooked one of those up to automatically deploy cakes next to the Kekamiris. Of course, you have other options. The random carpus isn't quite open to you yet, but something like the deployer is. Easy is just to use RF though. If your flower isn't connected to the spreader, either place the spreader before the flower, or use a Wand of the Forest in binding mode to bind the flower to the spreader, and then the spreader to the mana pool. Time for my first tree farm, sort of. I'll be making force trees, which give us force logs, which are required for making force gems, which are going to be used for a few different things, but for right now, my goal is force-infused biodiesel. I'll explain just how much better it is later, but for right now, I'm going to be using a phytogenic insulator to grow the saplings. Then I'll be using a sequential fabricator to craft the logs into planks, and finally a pyrolyzer to convert those into golden power source and liquid force. The liquid force is what we want to turn into force gems. Since we don't have access to the cyclical augment yet, it's going to be much easier to just stick a filter drawer on top of the thing, and we have it auto-export and auto import so what it's going to do when it finishes a cycle is it's going to push the logs out the back to the filtered drawer and it'll push the sapling out the top to the filtered drawer but then it sees it needs an item so what does it do it automatically pulls the sapling in from the drawer on top this is the power of having a side that can export and import from the same face while this isn't completely tileable it is still pretty tileable now all I have to do is hook up a thermopneumatic processing plant to accept the biodiesel that was already being generated and combine it with the force gems that I'm making now. This makes, as I said, force-infused biodiesel. And I'll just have to wait a bit for the system to properly clear out for it to get to the engines. Do note that the liquid crystallizer does require both mana and stress units to function, so make sure your design can compensate. It does accept power from the bottom, I just made it more complicated for no reason, I guess. While I wait for the system to flush itself of regular biodiesel, let's melt up some silver. This is going to be useful for producing acid aldehyde, which is an important fluid for later crafting. It's going to be made into both volatile redstone solution and phenolic resin. Phenolic resin combines with paper to make duroplast sheets, and those get combined with copper plates to make circuit backplanes. This means we have access to logic circuits now. Fun fact! In default immersive engineering and prior versions of this mod pack, the logic circuits didn't stack, and it was very annoying to craft with them. 
because your inventory just got flooded with these logic circuits. Alright, the system's finally just about ready to convert over. Remember that I have 6 diesel generators running right now, and it's producing about 12,000 SU. Once I run out of biodiesel in the diesel generators and the force-infused biodiesel takes over, I'm getting 6,000 per generator for a total of 36,000 approximately. Closer to 37,000, but you get the point. Not only is this fuel three times more stress unit dense, it's also twice as efficient, as you only use one millibucket per tick instead of two. These diesel generators are incredibly good and will be only going up from here. I wonder who animated their really nice looking texture. Now it's time to get some tunnels going. Tunnels are a way of transporting things from inside the compact machine to outside and vice versa. You just need to mill up some ender pearls to get some ender pearl dust and you have pretty much everything else now that we have logic circuits going. To use a tunnel, you simply right click on the compact machine wall block inside the compact machine that you want to connect to outside the compact machine. Then you need to decide which face you're going to export or import from. Each of the orthogonal squares to the center square on the tunnel is going to correspond to one of the compass faces on the world map. Up is north, left is west, right is east, down is south. I'm pretty sure that's how it works. Then for the corners, the top one links to the top face and the bottom one to the bottom face as you would expect. Note that there is an internal buffer for the machine for its transfers. This means you're going to want a chest buffer on both sides and have the ability to pull out of that machine. Hoppers are a convenient way of doing this. I think I'll make a basic control circuit even though I'm not going to use it just yet. It's simply a logic circuit with mineral resin in the fluid encapsulator. The rest of this video is going to effectively be a rush to the assembly table. I want to get those automated bees, you know? Our first stop is Volatile Redstone. This is a combination of redstone and a seed aldehyde in the thermodynamic processing plant. How many times have I said that today? Put that volatile redstone in a fractionating still and it will split it into destabilized redstone and redstone acid. Redstone acid can be turned into etching acid using a spider eye, gunpowder, and rotten flesh. While destabilized redstone is used in a bunch of other various recipes for various things. Real quick, I'd like to automate that nether rack and soul sand I never got around to, and stone too eventually, but for right now, I can get away with an andesite mesh on that soul sand because the drop table is the same between it and mana steel. Mana steel will be processing the nether rack because it has special loot. By setting the worksite as a charging station, you can make a pressure mechanic who has some good and sometimes necessary trades. In this case, the tier 1 trade I want is a blueprint for the UV light box. However, the tier 2 trade can net us some transistors, which saves us some resources when crafting. Some tier 3 trades include pneumatic cylinders, which will also save us some materials. There's a lot of latex required, so anything that can save me some latex is welcome. So this is the UV light box. It's quite slow. It will over time turn empty PCBs into unfinished PCBs. You can determine the percentage chance of success that you want it to finish at if you want something lower than 100. However, I'm not one for fail chances, so I typically just max it out all the time. It will take a while, and it exponentially or rather logarithmically changes its speed, meaning that the later percentages take a lot longer than the earlier ones. This then sends the unassembled PCBs into an etching tank, which when filled with etching acid can process it. If you heat the etching tank, it will make it run faster, but the UV light box is probably your rate determining step anyway, so it's not really worth it. How about we give our new and improved pressure chamber automation a test run? By putting in a slime ball, some latex, and some gold nuggets, I can make those capacitors I needed. Like I said, those hoppers make it so that the interfaces open as little as possible. Naturally, because of the high pressure buffer, it won't have any issues keeping its pressure up. I'm gonna sidetrack for just a moment. By making a dissolution chamber, I can make the simple machine frame. This is going to be useful for making a marine fisher. I decided that I don't want to deal with all of that fancy fishing nonsense, and I just make an industrial foregoing machine that'll do it with no questions asked. To use the dissolution chamber, it doesn't have item stacks in it, so everything goes in one item at a time. You'll also want to make sure that you fill it with the correct fluid. If you want to empty it, you're going to need to use one empty mechanism tank. The marine fisher is going to run and I'll just let it sit for a while and we'll come back when I get the thing I'm looking for from it. That took less time than expected. 
What I wanted out of this was a Nautilus shell. This will allow me to make a temporal pouch. If you're familiar with time in a bottle, it's basically the same thing. As you wait with it in your inventory, it'll accumulate seconds for every second it's in your inventory. You can then spend those seconds to speed up things like machines. Very useful for some of our slower pieces of equipment. Make sure you have the power to support it though. Speaking of slow pieces of equipment, I've saved an empty PCB for this occasion. What I'm gonna do is put it in the UV light box, speed it the crap up, and we'll just see just how fast it processes. It's going much faster than it was before, and then that means the success rate is just gonna get higher that much quicker. For what time the temporal pouch was active, running it at 16 times speed, we ended up getting about 93%. That's very good, and basically means I don't have to wait for PCBs anymore, especially with how few of them you need. I really can't be bothered to make more of those pneumatic cylinders right now, so I'm just going to trade for them with that pressure mechanic. However, he requires Signalum coins for such a purchase. That means I'm going to need Signalum. In order to do that, I need an arc furnace, which means I need more blast bricks. Might as well set up automation for that right now. It's the same thing you saw before, except this time I'm using a logistical transporter to do the transporting instead of an item drain. What's good about this is that I can set up a drawer at the front end of it, and then when something is finished, it'll just go there first. Expect to see that trick a lot when we have these types of sequence assemblies. While the schematic hen builds the arc furnace structure, we're going to need another component to make it run, and that will be the arc furnace electrodes. In order to obtain them, we're going to need some HOP graphite. To get the dust for that, we simply give the crusher spirit some coal coke blocks, which of course we have automated now. Ah, oh, well, coal coke, but you get the point. Normally, the arc furnace electrodes are annoying to get and annoying to maintain, but in this mod pack, it's pretty easy for both. First and foremost, they have 100 times the durability they have normally, so they will last, well, 100 times longer, obviously. On top of that, you can just make them in any machine with a rod mold, rather than crafting them by hand and doing it with a blueprint or putting it in a machine for half durability. You can even enchant them. I don't know if I really want to do that at this moment, but it's a possibility, I guess. Do note that this thing is extremely power hungry and a lot of recipes vary in how much energy they use per tick. Despite how much power I was making already, I actually don't have enough to consistently run this thing, but that's okay. I'll spare you from most of the sitting here and watching it, but do know that it can run all 12 slots at once if you have the power to support such a thing. Obviously, we won't be approaching that point for a while, so don't worry about it just yet. Time to use money to pay to win. I can buy all these lovely pneumatic cylinders with these Signalum coins, and that'll make it so that I don't have to craft all of those, which requires six latex rubber sheets each. I'm sure I'll automate latex rubber soon enough, but for right now, I'm not really feeling like it, so money for the win. While I have no interest in an elytra right now, I am going to at least set up a production for moon dust. Under a full moon, it's going to craft it, but only under a full moon, so it's going to be a lot of waiting. But like I said, I don't really care about it right now, that's why I'm putting it in now and it'll be ready later. You should do this much earlier than I did though. I also got sturdy sheets going again. Right now I only need a couple, but always good to have spares, right? This is all preparation for the final thing of the episode. To run the pneumatic assembly controller, you're going to need a controller, an input, an output, a laser, a drill, a platform, and a program to put inside of it. The drill and laser combo program can do everything, so just make that one. Of course, it requires both of the individual drill and laser programs. Both the drill and the laser should be next to the platform, and both the input and the output should be diagonal to the platform and adjacent to the input or output chest. You can use one chest if you'd like. The way I have it set up, it's easier to just have separate chests. It's awfully slow at the start, but you can put in speed upgrades once you have the pressure to manage it. I'm just going to sit here and let these electron plates progress. I chose this recipe in particular because it gives us the upgrade base for productive bees. This is going to be extremely helpful for actually using bees and getting good use out of them. And thankfully, I've been automatically producing honeycombs and stuff this entire time, so I can get right into crafting with it. There are two upgrades that are of particular interest to me right now. The block upgrade allows it to produce full blocks of wood or stone instead of those chips, which made it 9 per, and that was just awful, right? So with this block upgrade, it simply makes a full block each. Now we have actual production going. The other is the simulation upgrade. 
This means that the bees never actually leave the hive, which means they don't go into the void and die. You can also put up to three quote-unquote flowering blocks in a feeding slab outside the hive so that they can automatically feed from it and produce respective crops. I went ahead and made some more carpenter bees, and look, they've made some wood logs for us. Note that they work on a large number of things that you might not expect. One of the example is living wood. Alternatively, you could also make a quarry bee and make reinforced stone, which I will be about to do. Farming bees require phytogrow. You can get niter for phytogrow by pulverizing sandstone. From there, use some of that quantum infused or stable whatever bedrock on a farmer bee to make a quarry bee. Quarry bees handle the dirts and stones of the world. Weirdly enough, they're compatible with chip dirt, in case you're into that. And so, once again, we have reached the end of the episode. And once again, we've gotten a lot of automation done today. Different things like cake, and automated bees, and most importantly, that force-infused biodiesel. So, with that, this has been Pick. I'm glad to have seen you, and I hope to see you again.